Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, this is our uh, second Did You Know You Could series uh, for the semester. I'm Eric Kalachik. I'm the director of the Hurry Institute for Computing. Our series here is meant to be a, uh, a easy entry uh, introduction uh, to things that you maybe didn't know you could do, but would be delighted to know you could and you can use in your own research. Uh, and uh, what we have today is uh, taking us in the direction, direction of smart analytics and earth and environment and sustainability. Upcoming themes are going to be uh, use of social media to amplify your research and then later better understanding news and social media, right? And so you see in this series, we really go through a whole spectrum of different topics. Um, we're delighted to have our, uh, our guest today who our uh, host is going to introduce. So my job is to introduce our uh, host. This is a series that is uh, conceived and executed by the Hurry Institute Graduate Student Fellows. Uh, today's host is Luca Morreale. Luca is a PhD student in Earth and Environment at BU here. He's a graduate trainee as well in the graduate program in the Urban Biogeosciences and Environmental Health. His dissertation research is using computational ecology to quantify the effects of forest fragmentation. And in general, he's interested in applying techniques from data and computer sciences uh, to better utilize ecological data. So Luca, it's all yours. Thanks for that introduction, Eric. And thanks everyone for attending today. Uh, before I introduce our speaker, we wanna to get to know our audience a little bit. So we're gonna take this opportunity to get to know you a little bit better and it'll help us shape and facilitate the discussion and just gives us some information on who's attending. So with that, we're gonna have three very quick Zoom uh, questions and we'd just like you to answer the questions in the Zoom chat, please. So our first question is using our Zoom chat feature, can you please type what is your field of study? Broadly, more specific, just so that we can get a sense of it. And if you'll do that right now, that would be great. Okay, we'll give you just a couple more seconds. All right, so we have a couple answers of neurobiology, remote sensing, public health and health systems. So we're spanning a nice group here, you know, as Eric nicely introduced me, my background is more in uh, ecology and environmental sciences, but in my training here at EU, I've also leaned into a little bit of public health and stuff. So we're spanning a nice range here. For our second question, um, can you please let us know your familiarity. It's gonna be a poll and your familiarity with today's subject and using analytics to improve the world. So really kind of the applied side of data analysis and spatial analysis. If you'll go ahead and answer right now. Okay. Again, we have a little bit of a range. Um, a few people said familiar, a few people said a little bit, and a couple of people said none, no familiarity. So this is good. This will be a great use of this topic and better get to know the topic. And then finally, our last question is going to be, what are you hoping to gain from today? Um, you know, this series has been structured to introduce people and um, spark conversations. What specifically are you trying to get from today's presentation? If you'll go ahead and type that into the uh, Zoom chat and I will quickly synthesize. While people are answering, I will say my answer is that <clears throat> uh, it's very similar to the reason why I'm interested in being, I'm so excited to be a part of the Hariri Center and part of the urban program and in general here at BU is that we have all these techniques, whether from environmental science, analysis, data analysis, computer science, and we're very used to working with data, but often 
I think it is challenging to make that leap, particularly from within academia, to step into how do you actually make real tangible differences in the world. It's one thing to publish scientific papers, um, but if you know, there's a term that's the loading dock problem, that if we just publish the papers and put them out there, then we maybe don't uh, have people uh, using them as much as we would like. And so I'm really excited to hear about a lot of real world examples um, of how to specifically work from within academia or just use these techniques to help the world. Um, yeah, and so some of the answers we've got are application and short-term future of smart analytics. So where are we now and where are we going? And uh, yeah, also more specifically, learning how to use them for global change research. Yeah, so great. Thank you for your answers and thank you all for participating. It really helps helps us um, frame these conversations and gives us a little bit of, a, bit of feedback. So with that, I have the pleasure of introducing you to our speaker, Professor Gopal. She's a professor in the Department of Earth and Environment here at Boston University. She has bachelor's and master's degrees in geography from Madras University in Madras, India, and a PhD in geography from the University of Santa Barbara in California. Uh, she's been a professor here at Boston University for many years, and over that time she has served on countless advisory boards, service positions, and from what I could tell, the broad interconnecting theme was how to use spatial analysis to address problems in biology, environmental science, public health, business, topics spanning the globe. And to cover that, some of her recent work includes, but is definitely not limited to, malaria risk mapping in Ethiopia, marine decision making in Massachusetts, and assessing the impact of climate change on food security and biodiversity in Cambodia. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand things over to Professor Gopal to talk to us about creating a better planet using smart analytics. Thank you so much, Luca. So I'm going to share my screen and get started. Uh, please do let me know if you have questions so I can take it as we uh, go along. Uh, I'm gonna go into my presentation mode here. Oops. There we go. Um, I hope you can all see it. So I wanted to talk to you about the kinds of research problems that are coming in with the use of geospatial data. There's plenty of geospatial data that's available and there's a lot of math, statistics, computer science, which is needed because these data come in multiple sort of time resolutions, spatial resolutions, and it's a lot of different data to sort of merge and blend together in order to derive any type of insights. So I want to talk to you about the things that are happening up there, out in the world. People are talking about big earth observation data. And I generally don't like to use the word big data but this is true of earth sciences because there's so many satellites capturing so many different things about the earth's surface, including even population, because the lights of the world sort of tell you something about the population. There is also a lot of um, conceptual framing of space and time sort of data and trying to understand what is the computational data structure that one needs to use in order to sort of represent this data and derive, again, analysis and meaning out of it. And I'm working with two people in the math stats department, two professors, Mark and Julio Castrillon, who's probably on this call, on looking at these kinds of problems on change detection, because we do need more advanced methods than what we have currently. And of course, everybody knows about cloud computing. The other thing that has really changed our world recently is the drone revolution. There's a drone for everything. So drones are very useful in places like Indonesia, where I can't really go into flooded areas and get data out. So we are using a lot of drones in other parts of the world to collect data. And even social media data, which is my last circle diagram, is also spatially, uh, you know, has got a spatial stamp on it. And this has led to a whole new industry called location-based uh, you know, systems. Um, and these are even used on dating apps. So this is like another world in terms of connecting it to social media data. So I wanted to show you some of the research themes and research that we are working on. The other big thing that has happened in the last 10 years is the rising use of Google Earth Engine. Google has really made 
um, data sharing, uh, data processing, cloud computing, and things of that nature that was beyond the reach of regular citizens all over the world. If you can program, you could be anywhere in the world, use your Google Earth engine to make all kinds of uh, processing and analysis. And so it has made it more of a democracy in terms of data sharing because you know, it provides this cloud computing platform. So this particular figure that you see up on your screen is a Google Earth capture using uh, Landsat, looking at flood status in the area called Semarong in North Java. We have an NSF funded pro project right in this part of the world. So we can capture where exactly all the floods and even uh, you know, let the people in, that we work with in the universities in Indonesia know about our mapping so they can validate to see whether we are capturing the signals right. So this is a project that we undertook as part of an NSF grant. So increasingly, there's a lot of classification being done on Google Earth, a change detection, and a lot of use of AI using this huge database uh, and cloud computing. And I can talk a bit more about it. So this is another aspect of this type of data. We have a lot of data, including wind velocity and ocean currents. So this part of uh, Bali, which is northern part of Bali, not the southern part where the beaches are, is exposed to a lot of sea level rise as well as action of the waves. And during pretty bad El Nino years, they're going to see more of erosion because of the currents. So they are asking, so I'm working with the professors there in Indonesia, looking at this type of problem of sea level rise and dynamic shoreline processes happening in Indonesia. We have similar projects, of course, in uh, New England in the Northeast that I'll speak about with Professor Les Kaufman. So this is again part of our NSF IRIS grant where we take students from Boston University and Tufts University on, a, on for a six week uh, uh, research experience in Semarong in Java. And they get to go do a lot of things in terms of field data collection. They're able to use remote sensing and GIS. And we are able to do a lot of applications and planning for uh, places in Indonesia that don't have access to that type of science, although they are growing. So they have all kinds of programs that we are affiliated with. So I do want to talk about one application in great detail so you can latch on to it. Because of climate change, there is in increased incidence of many, many diseases all across the world. One thing that BU is studying is of course, air quality and asthma, and it's associated with so many other things we are studying that. But I'm interested in skin cancer because of exposed UV radiation. So the American Cancer Society uh, indicates that this is growing. It's a growing problem in Canada, in North America, in Europe, and so on. So we are looking at a particular type of cancer called non-melanoma skin cancer. So this sort of impacts a certain type of people of a certain race. So it is a very spatial type of problem, and it is never entered into cancer registries because of the fact that it is not the most important type of cancer. So we could sort of assess the incidence, we could educate the public, we can increase awareness. And of course, many of the physicians, including dermatology practices, do want to know about how to go about leveraging this type of climate change understanding to create new types of clinics and uh, outreach and so on. So only older people are prone to get the non-melanoma skin cancer. So you're usually above the age 65. And it is also malignant, mostly among whites, Caucasian population. And it is also more prone in areas that have more of UV radiation. So all of this, as you can see, is a spatial type of data. I have data on UV radiation from a NASA sensor. I have data on old, I mean, aging population in the United States at a county level, at a census block level, which is the finest resolution that I can find. And I also have information on men and women, gender and age, race, and so on. So we could examine what exactly is the risk factors, what's happening in Florida and Arizona versus Illinois and New Hampshire. 
which do not have so much of the same problems, but of course they get, do have a lot of sunlight in the summer months. So here is a map that shows the uh, population that's prone to get this non-melanoma skin cancer, percent which is considered white in the US census in 2018 out of the total population. And as you can see, there's a lot of red up north. There's more green in California, Florida, Texas, and so on. And so this is the distribution of uh, you know, population uh, that's Caucasian and white. Here is a population of people who are 65 and above. So you may ask me, why did I take 65? Why didn't I take 55 or 60 or so on? So anything is possible. This is just an example. So if I overlay the two maps, I can sort of see a lot of things on these maps. And on top of it, I'm showing you uh, places where there are clinics which do what is called most surgery. They go in and remove that patch of non-melanoma skin cancer on your skin. And so those are the little gray dots that you see all over the country. So you can put in a lot of spatial data and make a lot of different insights on this growing problem. And this is only increasing because of climate change. So you may want to stop and ask why are there so many clinics in New England? You know, when I said that it is not so exposed to UV rays. So let me show you the next map. So this shows the UV exposure on a monthly basis across the US. So I want you to watch this map and tell me your observation points. I'll jump in. One thing I notice is that New England has a very low uh, risk of mm -hmm. uh, UV for most of the year. Right. So if I were to use that information, you know, and I go, I'm sort of puzzling over why are there so many clinics and doctors and dermatology practices that focus on this type of cancer in the Northeast, certainly around Chicago, you notice a few clinics, and I'm not so surprised that there are a lot of clinics in California, in Arizona, you know, and Florida in particular. So we notice that there may be, this may be the population that is the migrant population, because a lot of senior citizens, especially in the Northeast and Chicago, have second homes in Florida. So they may be vacationing in Florida, coming back for the treatment. So there's a lot of factors that we can understand and derive out of this data. And there are certain other things that we have to make certain assumptions. So if you put all these together, we can make a non-melanoma skin cancer prediction and try to sort of check it against physicians who write prescriptions, physicians who do things like, the, you know, or treat these patients from some of the uh, Medicaid database. We don't have any direct information on this particular type of cancer you know, at a county level or even at a state scale because the CDC doesn't collect it. So this is a very nice project in the sense that we can bring all the intelligence that we know from reading all these papers and putting together our own map of non-melanoma skin cancer uh, and sort of suggest that this perhaps is the pattern. So this is the paper that I'm writing with a bunch of people. So I just wanted to show you one quick example. So the other thing that we generally do is we try to convert all the science that we have into some sort of policy and to different stakeholders. So this is a project that we are currently working on in the Biscayne Bay in Florida. There's a lot of uh, water that runs off from the different watersheds in Florida into the Biscayne Bay that is impacting uh, the marine organisms as well as the corals in the Biscayne. And all of this is also leading to all kinds of strange patterns. The red dots that you see is one of my favorite manatees. So we have manatee location points over a 10 year period of how they migrate north and south along the coast. So we are putting together all of these things in order to understand you know, environmental stewardship. Why do we need to protect areas in Biscayne? This is like a vital tourist spot. And we are trying to inform the many different stakeholders 
you know, what exactly is going on and trying to educate and inform people a bit. So uh, that was one thing. The other project that was interesting from my point of view is something that we are working on at the Global Development Policy Center, Kevin Gallagher Center at BU. This is my student Yashang Ma's dissertation. He's looking at, you know, we are all examining the Belt Road Initiative that China is building all across the globe. And China has already done a lot of energy investments in this part of Southeast Asia. And this area is one of the most important biodiversity zones, hotspots in the world, both for marine as well as terrestrial organisms. And we are trying to understand the impact of each one of these energy investments in this part of the world. And we bring in a lot of different types of data and we are looking at 20 years of deforestation using satellite imagery, looking at uh, world wildlife organizations, mapping, putting it all together in order to understand what is the impact on the various organisms on the ground. So I thought this was interesting because that's a current project with another student. So I sort of feel, you know, that there's a lot of multidisciplinary areas that we could all be involved in. Each person brings a different set of skills. I have my spatial skills, spatial modeling, and uh, you know, AI and pattern uh, matching skills. And I'm working with the math department. I work with biology. I'm working with uh, Kevin Gallagher and the Development uh, Center, as well as the Institute for Sustainability. And it is so important to get everybody to sort of you know work on these projects because each person has a different skill set. So the first set of row of people are all in marine planning and conservation. We are working on three or four different projects across the globe, um, looking at conservation priorities. Um, you know, with the Joe Biden administration, there's going to be a lot more uh, importance attached to preserving certain planning areas in the oceans. So we are working on that. I did mention Kevin Gallagher and China's Belt Road Initiative, trying to understand what's going on in terms of impacts. And Kevin is also very interested in indigenous populations across the globe. He has several students working and postdocs working on those types of projects, very important work. Uh, the next one is on chain detection. I did mention Mark Kahn and Julio Castrillon. We just submitted a proposal to NSF and we've also worked on gas leaks um, and looking at what can we do about it uh, in Boston. That was the previous proposal we wrote that didn't get funded. Then I'm working with Megali Koch and Professor Helmi in Indonesia on coastal areas I showed you. Lawrence, who is on the conversation here today, we have several projects that we are looking at uh, in terms of women's healthcare in Kenya, accessibility, healthcare utilization, insurance utilization, and so on. And the last one is a BU Ignition Grant that's awarded usually to faculty to develop some idea. And so we have a SaaS platform with uh, Josh Pitts, who's a software engineer. My uh, new venture, uh, which is all about sustainable, you know, uh, looking at sustainability and sustainable investment and looking at things where you need a lot of data in order to make, uh, you know, any kind of decisions on risk. So I'm going to stop there and take your questions um, because I just wanted to finish and have more of a conversation rather than, you know, talk and talk about research. So any questions? Thank you, Suchi, for that wonderful talk. Give everyone, give a virtual round of applause. Thank you. Um, with that, we'd like to open the Q&A session, which I, am I will be moderating. Um, if anyone has a question, you're more than welcome to put it in the chat and I can read it out for you, or you're welcome to ask it yourself. Um, with that, I'm happy to start us off with kind of a broader question. You mentioned a lot of different subject areas, right? A lot of places where these techniques and this um, approach is really useful and really important. Does any one place, whether it's 
I don't know, biodiversity, um, public health, does any one kind of subject stand out as the place that is furthest ahead in implementing these techniques or using them? And conversely, does there is there a place that stands out as being the most in need of kind of relying on these, this approach? So that's a very good question, Luca. So as you can see with what has happened with COVID and COVID distribution in the United States, science, the best data, optimization algorithms, and so on. The one thing that we really don't understand is human behavior in all its many facets. So that is one thing that sort of, you know, um, makes it very hard to implement policies on the ground. So in places like Cambodia and Indonesia, we are sort of working with policy makers. And I did use the word stakeholders. There are multiple stakeholders, including the ministries. So in Cambodia, we worked with the Ministry of Environment because we were looking at food, water, and energy security in Cambodia. And so we developed an interface for them, a policy sort of a tool, so they could go and visualize. And some of the, the requests that they had was pretty simple in the sense they just wanted like a dashboard. They wanted to produce a report so they could share and have a discussion. So sometimes, you know, they could be the best science, but somehow to translate the science into policy, we really need to understand who are the stakeholders, what is the type of policy that they want to make out of it in order for us to exactly highlight those kinds of stakeholders and those kinds of policies. So we've been pretty successful, I would say, in the Indonesian venture because they're listening and we are working with the university. So it's not like us sort of telling them something. We are working in conjunction with the university there. So that's pretty successful. We've done similar work in Belize. We are also doing, we've also done work in Cambodia uh, with stakeholders. So that was pretty successful, I would say. And of course, in Massachusetts, with the ocean planning organization, we are working with several NGOs, which can also be very useful. Thank you so much. We have a question from the chat. Gina asks, what are the best practices for presenting these findings from analyzing complex data sets to policymakers? So one of the things that they seem to like is pretty simple uh, data visualization kind of tools. So it could be so complicated. And of course, everybody loves a map, but they do want to understand data. When you talk about risk, what exactly, because risk is such a fuzzy sort of a topic. How are you defining your risk? Is that based on social risk or is it based on economic risks or environmental risk or water risk? Can you define it? So sometimes we let them sort of move uh, things around and see their own levels of risk based on the science. So we don't compose like, you know, comprehensive metrics for them. We want them to be educated. So we do like several outreach workshops and so on. We've done many in Cambodia. I even forget how many times we visited uh, Cambodia. So, and we are trying to, we find that the best people in, in those countries who want to really learn are the young people. And they really want to understand what they are facing in terms of climate change or water and so on, water security and so on. So anything should be digestible to their level of understanding. So for the minister, we have to make a different set of metrics. For somebody who's a, an NGO, we need to present it in a slightly different way. So sometimes I bring these problems to my class and I let the students in my GIS classes work on it. So one of the things that a bunch of monks in Cambodia asked me is, they want to know landmines in Cambodia. All over Cambodia, because of the Vietnam War, there are landmines and people are getting maimed and killed and so on. So they wanted to make some nice maps, you know, of uh, danger and hazards and uh, make it kind of, you know, useful, you know, so they could use it in their own education campaigns. So things can come out if we know who is the stakeholder, what are they going to use it for, and how do we even message it such that they understand how to use it. 
So Suchi, a question for you. One of the things we're hoping uh, is evocative by the, the, the name, did you know you could, is that people feel uh, that they're empowered to be able to do uh, what, what they see. So how accessible or how, what's the lift to do? Uh, I clearly you need the, 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 the knowledge uh, in the domain areas and you need the knowledge of map making and whatnot, but what is it that Google Earth Engine and some of the related platforms that you're using do to help shorten that distance in making the lift? Uh, what can you point people to in terms of points of entry? That's a very good question. So previously, all of this satellite imagery and data was not available to people locally. I mean, you had to be in either in Europe or in US to get access even to the Landsat data. And why do you need that data? It's constantly updated. You're not going to be making a map of the forest you know, every year in any one of these countries. We need to have satellite data for things of that sort and even weather and climate. And now they have access to all of that um, in their own countries because it's all, anybody can have a Google access. And so they need training on how to use these types of applications and platforms and they're getting pretty good at it. So I'm working with the Indonesian professors and they showed me all these maps of ocean currents and ocean depth and so on. So they're pretty, um, they are very curious, they want to learn and it's advanced and the access to data that they did not have before is now possible. That I think is the most wonderful thing that's happened in the last 10 years, that everybody has the same uh, set of data to begin with. And then the science follows because you need to build models on top of the data. And so, so given the data, which, which is huge, it sounds like, um, what sort of analysis, um, how facilitated is the analysis within Google Earth Engine? Is, is it accessing the data and then you need ArcGIS or something like that to work no, with? No, or is Google it the suite has, of tools is built yeah. there? Uh, yeah. yeah. So Google Earth, I mean, you need to have some you know, some remote sensing knowledge, but if you are sort of uh, trained to think, you know, and you have, you're curious to know, you could sort of teach yourself because there are so many people across the globe helping each other. So this is again, a social media enabled sort of platform. People are exchanging ideas all the time. And as you know, many of the journals these days, Eric, and um, you know, they all do open publications. You pay for those publications but then your paper is accessible to anybody. They can download, print, and look at it. So, and uh, the other thing is the research gate, I guess, you know, where you can make your articles accessible free to anybody else who's asking. So they are, people are able to access information that they could not before. And there are all these social media channels. And I hate to use the word social media there, which makes it possible for people across the globe to exchange ideas. So Google Earth is being widely used even by people and practitioners who are not so familiar with remote sensing. They understand that they need to understand deforestation. They know what bands to look because the algorithms are already written. Somebody had written it out and they explained because Google has all kinds of standard protocols on how you write the utility, how to use the, you know, that particular program. And so you know, it makes it uh, somewhat more easy and it's equalizing access to data. Thank you, super helpful. We have another question from the chat. Natalie asks, um, can you model future impacts of the change in climate on species migrations using smart analytics? So asking about a specific application of the techniques you just talked about. So this is a very interesting question, Luca. We are working on this marine project on the East Coast. What is surprising is, we have a lot of data. We have, of course, remote sensing data of the ocean, which gives us surface temperature in a very good way. It also gives information on productivity and so on, and ocean currents, of course, and ice and so on. But there's not much clarity on the ocean, the water column of the ocean, right? Because the bottom temperatures and what we need to know is like a big surprise. One of the projects that we are working on is looking at sand mining you know, which is very common in order to 
re-establish beaches along the East Coast. Very expensive towns all along the East Coast are losing their beaches because the sand is eroding because of the action of the waves as well as the rising sea levels. So towns are replacing their beaches because the town will lose its property value if there's no beach. Where do they get the sand from? They have to go mine it from the ocean. So the project that we are working on with the Bureau of Ocean Management is where exactly should you mine for that sand? Because the sand is a very important uh, you know, source for sand lands, which is the tiniest fish that lives in the sand, burrows itself in the sand, and that's eaten even by whales and the bigger fish. It's part of the food chain, a food web. And so it is, it is like impossible to sort of, you know, disconnect the problems. We need a lot of understanding and we don't know a lot about the ocean depths. And so, uh, you know, it's like, it, in some cases we have direct answers, in some cases we have to model and make estimates about the future. But all of the scientists on the East Coast say that there are dramatic changes in the ocean waters and you know, you see migration paths of the whales changing, seals changing, lobsters changing. They seem to read the climate change signal better than we do because they're all migrating north. So this is something that we've learned recently that there are really dramatic changes in the ocean, you know, as it impacts the animals, especially whales and important fish for us, commercial fish. Great. Quick follow-up question. What it sounds like I'm hearing from you is that one of the inherent limitations of the smart analytics techniques is the quality of your data, that we absolutely want to answer these things, but if you don't have the on-the-ground data, and this is part of my question, is where remote sensing data is wonderful, but without on-the-ground data, how useful is it? And the like, second part of that question and relating to the species migrations idea of, do we need to, in pairing with this increase in availability of satellite data and proliferation of these techniques, do we need to pair it with an increase of on-the-ground measurements? Um, yeah, that's it, the question. Very good question. So if I'm looking at the sandlands, nobody has studied the sandlands except at a few locations. I don't have any super, I mean, I don't have any data to supervise my algorithm with. I do need a lot more data, but we do know that sandlands has a much larger distribution. Many of these, many, the scientists who study the oceans, they don't have money to go deep into the ocean for extended periods of time, you know, to go study organisms. So they have field collections. And we are using that. So validation is always going to be a problem. It's a huge problem. And that is true, even one of the applications that I worked on is predicting how does AI impact automation in the future? How, what are the jobs that are going to be lost in the US, right, in the next 10 years? So just looking at those kinds of things, we need to use a lot of uh, you know, estimates that economists and other people have made of what they think is going to happen. But nothing is like 100% true. These are just estimates based on theoretical ideas that people in different places have generated. So the best thing that we have is to use the most widely cited accepted ideas in order to estimate into the future. The insurance company wants to know what's in the future. You see, the insurance company always use the past data, you know, in order to estimate the future risk in countries like the US or even in Papua New Guinea. But now they cannot use the past anymore. Things are happening so rapidly that they want to look at the future climate scenarios. That's one of the questions that they're asking. How do we use things of the, you know, the climate models of the IPCC into the future? business as usual, you know, somewhat risky predictions and so on, regional pathways sort of climate models and predict into the future. So no validation, we just need to go by what is the accepted scientific norm at this point, which can change anytime. Great, thank you. Uh, morning, Switchy, how are you? How are you, Lawrence? Good to see you. Good to see you too. 
Uh, so um, I know we we've talked a lot about um, the power of smart analytics, uh, but the the other side of it is the ethics and the privacy uh, questions that are, are come with uh, uh, the tools that smart analytics is allowing us to be able to ask questions and get insights that we, we couldn't get 10 years ago. What, what are your thoughts on the balancing uh, the insights you're getting with uh, privacy and all the ethical issues that comes with smart analytics? So with all of the geospatial data, this is the biggest worry, just like in health data. So in terms of a collection of data, it doesn't drop down to the finest level possible. You know, we, it stops at a somewhat of a coarse level as, uh, you know, a city census tract or something in the United States. And in Europe, you couldn't get that kind of data, right? So if it stops at the census tract, there are certain areas where there are less than 50 people in a census tract. They, I won't even be able to use that information. You know, it's ethically not correct to use that information because you can locate the 50 people with some disease, which may impact their insurance. So there's a lot of legal aspects of GIS that are up and open for debate. I just did something on AI and ethics with the University of Arizona on another webinar where we discussed these kinds of issues. And there are a lot of people in the country working on those types of issues, looking at the legal ramifications. And I think for those uh, issues of privacy and uh, things of that nature of data privacy issues and security issues, I think the law department has to be involved. And I know even at BU, there are a few people who are interested in those types of laws. But in certain cases, Lawrence, we cannot sort of hold back and say data is private, we can't. So if you look at human trafficking across the globe, you need to get to the bottom of that problem of human trafficking because children are being trafficked and so on. So there are some leeways for certain issues with certain people who have all the clearance to go in and look at those issues, even using uh, computer, you know, social media or whatever networks they use to study that problem. Okay, thank you. Good question though. And we run into the same problem in terms of our insurance and, uh, you know, HIV women. Why don't you talk about it? Because they have to buy insurance. Then that means it's automatically they're HIV positive and they're expecting babies. It is like a rot issue, but you and I know that they need insurance in order to have safe delivery. This is in Kenya, the problem that I'm working with uh, Lawrence on. You wanna talk about it, Lawrence? Yeah, uh, what, 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 what Suchi is referencing is uh, uh, we, we, we have a project that is trying to look at um, one uh, special predictors of health insurance enrollment among HIV positive pregnant women. Uh, and and the, the ethical dilemma there is that we know that health insurance does confer benefits. And so how do you justify um, selectively enrolling people in insurance if we know that they have a health condition that would benefit from having health insurance? And if you want to do um, use smart analytics and do spatial analysis on this group, um, how do you use their geocodes to analyze uh, their spatial and temporal access uh, to health insurance and healthcare? Because if we have uh, the XY coordinates of their home, then it means we can identify where they live and you know their health status, which means that it's likely that insurance com companies would discriminate against insuring such people because they're already a high risk. Um, so one way you deal with that is you aggregate at you know, uh, a higher geographic space like a county or uh, if you're using census data uh, in Kenya, you aggregate at enumeration areas that are used to collect the data so that you, and in some cases they also scramble uh, the geocodes by at least uh, a factor of 10 kilometers.
I don't know if that I don't know if that helps you. No, that answers the question of privacy, right? In certain cases, you need it, but at the same time, you don't want to, you know, look at it at the finest possible spatial scale because it, you know, gives up someone's privacy. It's compromising. Great. Well, with that, we are just about out of time for the Q and A session. I would. If we, anyone has one last quick question, you're more than welcome to jump in, or I'm sure that you can reach out to Dr. Gopal or for email or anything to follow up with her after the talk. And with that, I would like to thank Professor Gopal for this wonderful presentation and this wonderful question and answer session. I'd like to thank all the attendees. Thank you for attending and participating. And of course, I would like to thank the Hariri Institute for supporting this event and making it happen without this place to kind of come together and talk we wouldn't be able to share ideas and have these discussions. I'd like to encourage everyone to attend the next uh, parts of these series. The next one is actually next week, I believe. And I don't, I have the date right in front of me. I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, I can't handle it right now, but next week we have another part of the uh, Did You Know You Could series, and I highly encourage you to attend, and I believe there's another one the week after. And so with that, I would like to wrap this up and thank everyone for participating and hopefully see you soon. Thanks, Luca. Thank you.